Hello, it's Eric from Strong Medicine, and today I'm discussing an approach to fever of unknown origin. To start with, what is a fever of unknown origin, or FUO? The classic definition consists of three components. A fever of at least 38.3 degrees Celsius, or 101.0 degrees Fahrenheit, on at least three occasions, a duration of illness of at least three weeks, and a lack of a diagnosis after a thorough history, exam, and one week of hospitalization for testing. This definition has been around for over 50 years, but there are some problems with it. First, the specific temperature cutoff ignores temperature variability between individuals. It does not explicitly require fever to be the predominant symptom of the person's illness. The definition may not be equally applicable to immunocompromised patients. In the 21st century, the evaluation for an FUO is often completed as an outpatient, and the defined duration of testing is arbitrary and dependent on the efficiencies of one's healthcare system. For all of these reasons, there have been recent attempts to revise the definition of FUO, though there is not yet a specific consensus on this in the literature. So I'm going to give you my proposed revised definition, which addresses these shortcomings. Unlike some other proposed revisions, which have needed to include only objective criteria for the purposes of consistency across research studies, I'm only considering what criteria I would use to define a distinct clinical entity to allow for diagnosis in an individual patient. I consider an FUO to be present when a person's temperature is significantly elevated over their baseline on at least several occasions. Fever is the most prominent symptom of the illness. The duration of symptoms has been at least three weeks. And there is no provisional diagnosis after a thorough history, exam, CBC, complete metabolic panel, UA, blood and urine cultures, chest x-ray, and abdominal imaging. When it comes to the etiologies of fever, in some ways it has an unusually short list. Almost all fevers are caused by either an infection, malignancy, or a classification of diseases known as non-infectious inflammatory diseases, which are predominantly autoimmune in mechanism. However, in other ways, fever has an unusually long list of etiologies, since any infection, any malignancy, and any systemic inflammatory disease can cause it. But also consider that most diseases which cause fever do not commonly cause a fever of unknown origin. For example, fever is one of the most common features of pneumonia, but for a person with pneumonia to be predominantly symptomatic with fever, rather than shortness of breath or cough, would be unusual, and for them to have an unremarkable chest x-ray would be extremely unusual. Different studies have found a different proportion of FUOs to be caused by infection, malignancy, and non-infectious inflammatory diseases. These differences are based on geography, time period, and specific definition used for FUO. Worldwide, currently infections are likely the most common general cause of FUO. However, in the developed world, currently the most common general cause of FUO is likely idiopathic, meaning no specific cause is found after a thorough investigation over weeks. Now, let me go through some notable specific examples of diseases which can present as FUO. Infections include extrapulmonary tuberculosis, abscesses, although most abscesses in general are intra-abdominal or intrapelvic, these are usually evident on abdominal imaging, particularly on CT. Endocarditis, secondary to difficult to culture organisms, osteomyelitis and discitis, the latter of which frequently coexists with vertebral osteo, Infected hardware, such as a prosthetic joint infection. Anecdotally, prosthetic hip infections are more likely to be without overt physical exam evidence compared to prosthetic knees. And infected thrombosis, including a condition called Lemierre's syndrome, which is infected thrombophlebitis of the internal jugular vein, most often by anaerobic bacteria, which spreads locally from a throat infection. Malaria. Brucellosis is a zoonotic bacterial infection spread by exposure to farm animals or consumption of unpasteurized dairy products. 
fever is another zoonotic bacterial infection, typically spread by farm animals, but occasionally pets. And both the Epstein-Barr virus and cytomegalovirus can cause FUO. Among malignancies, FUO is more common among hematologic ones, which include lymphoma, leukemia, and multiple myeloma. The cell tumors most commonly associated with fever include renal cell carcinoma, pancreatic adenocarcinoma, and hepatocellular carcinoma, although all three of those would usually be picked up with abdominal imaging. Among the so-called non-infectious inflammatory diseases that can present as FUO are lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, and vasculitis, particularly temporal arteritis because it's the most common vasculitis. All of these are autoimmune diseases. Sarcoidosis is a multi-system disease of unclear underlying pathogenesis, which most commonly affects the lungs and lymph nodes. Adult-onset stills disease is also a disease of unknown pathogenesis, which is characterized by fevers, rash, pharyngitis, and arthralgias. And familial Mediterranean fever is a rare genetic disease predominantly found in individuals of Mediterranean and Middle Eastern ancestry, which is caused by a gain-of-function mutation affecting a protein called pyrin, which plays a role in normal immune function. Its clinical manifestations are recurrent episodes of fever, arthralgia, and chest and abdominal pain caused by serosal inflammation. Last, there are a number of miscellaneous causes of FUO. Drug fever is a medication side effect that can be caused by one of several mechanisms, but is most common allergic in nature. It usually starts 7 to 10 days after the causative medication is begun, but can occur months later. It resolves within several days of medication cessation. Factitious fever is a form of either factitious disorder or malingering, in which the patient is deliberately causing the fever, either by manipulating the temperature recording device, or by secretly injecting themselves with something to trigger it, such as bacteria. The hypothalamus in the brain is the location of our temperature regulation center. Dysfunction of the hypothalamus caused by either neurosurgery or compression by an intracranial mass can cause abnormalities of body temperature. Castleman disease is a group of similar lymphoproliferative diseases, which are not technically cancer, but which share features with lymphoma. And Kikuchi disease is a necrotizing lymph adenitis of unknown etiology most commonly affecting people under the age of 40 and manifesting as fever and cervical lymphadenopathy. Finally, as mentioned before, there is idiopathic FUO, in which despite a thorough investigation, which I'll review in a few minutes, the etiology remains unknown. The reason that it's important to include idiopathic in this framework is because, as mentioned, it is one of the most common etiologies of FUO worldwide. Other common etiologies probably include extrapulmonary TB, abscesses, endocarditis, lymphoma, lupus, and adult-onset Stills disease. Adult-onset Stills disease is not a common disease overall, but FUO is one of its most common presentations, whereas a disease like rheumatoid arthritis has a much higher prevalence, but few RA cases present as FUO. When performing an HNP on a patient presenting with FUO, what are some key components to the history? The first thing to realize, which may be a little bit surprising, is that the degree of fever and the timing and pattern of fever are generally not diagnostically helpful. For example, you cannot rule out a diagnosis based on the maximum temperature a patient experiences. One exception in which the time pattern might be helpful is malaria, in which certain species of the malarial protozoa cause different periodicities to the fevers, though this periodicity may be lacking relatively early in the illness. Ask about the response to antipyretics. In particular, fevers caused by cancers have been described as having more response to naproxen than infections do. Medication history is important due to the possibility of drug fever, and the sexual history might reveal HIV risk factors that could broaden the differential diagnosis to include opportunistic infections. A good exposure history is critical when evaluating an FUO. The major exposure categories include travel, animals, and to a lesser extent, occupation. Although in general, the review systems 
rarely picks up diagnostically helpful pieces of information. This is one presentation in which a thorough review of systems is justified. Particularly concerning or red flag symptoms in FUO include weight loss, drenching night sweats, and an inability to perform ADLs, all of which suggest a particularly dangerous etiology. As with the review of systems, FUO is one of the few presentations which truly does warrant a so-called complete physical exam, with particular attention paid to the lymph nodes, the spleen, and the back, the last of which is to help identify vertebral osteomyelitis and discitis. As mentioned previously, in order for a patient to even be considered to have an FUO, a preliminary workup must already have been done. This includes a CBC, metabolic panel, two to three sets of blood cultures, a UA and urine culture, a chest x-ray, and abdominal imaging. I prefer a CT of the abdomen and pelvis over a complete abdominal ultrasound, as long as there are no potential contraindications, such as pregnancy. Assuming these are all non-diagnostic, they should be followed by additional tests. Let's talk more about them. The algorithm I'll show you here is roughly similar to published algorithms for FUO, but not precisely identical because this is my version based on my experience and knowledge of the currently most common etiologies. Testing in FUO is typically done in a series of tiers in which the highest yield, least invasive, and or least expensive tests are favored first. At any point, if a localizing symptom is noted, a physical finding observed, or an abnormal test result seen, the testing should immediately be redirected to look into that some more, keeping in mind that some of these seemingly associated findings may be unrelated to the primary presentation. The initial group of tests, or tier one, I've already listed. The next step is to stop any empiric antibiotics that have already been started, since they will diminish the yield of future cultures. Then in tier two, one should repeat blood cultures, check an HIV and an interferon gamma release assay for tuberculosis, just one example of which is the quantiferon test, check LDH as a marker for hematologic malignancies, SPEP as a test for multiple myeloma, ANA to look for lupus and other autoimmune diseases, anti-CCP antibody, which is seen in rheumatoid arthritis, ferritin, which can be extremely elevated in adult onset stills disease, and heterophile antibodies, which are found in EBV. It's very commonly recommended to check an ESR and CRP, but I personally do not find these to be diagnostically helpful. They are very nonspecific markers of inflammation, which are elevated in almost every etiology of FUO. So I would not check them, but know that 9 out of 10 doctors would. A CT of the chest can identify small abscesses missed on x-ray, as well as hilar and mediastinal lymphadenopathy that could suggest malignancy or sarcoidosis. Consider CK, ANCA, and cryoglobulins, which all look for a variety of rare autoimmune diseases, and a serum ACE level, which can be abnormal in sarcoidosis. Depending on whether the patient has any risk factor for these, consider serologies for Coxiella brunettii, which is the pathogen responsible for Q fever, Bartonella species, and Brucella species. And consider additional tests for infection depending upon geography and travel, for example, a blood smear for malaria. If all of those are non-diagnostic, at that point, I would suggest repeating the complete history and exam, preferably by a clinician not previously familiar with the patient, in case there was something that the prior clinicians had missed. Consider the diagnostic cessation of any potential causes of drug fever that were not already considered. And make sure the patient has undergone age-appropriate cancer screening. Age-appropriate cancer screening is predominantly looking for colon, breast, and cervical cancer, all of which are very rare causes of FUO, but the patient will need these tests done anyway. At this point, if the patient is still without a diagnosis, they move to the final tier, which usually consists of a nuclear medicine scan of some kind. Historically, this was the tagged white cell scan, but more recently, a PET scan has become more popular for this purpose. Both of these scans identify general areas of inflammation, so they don't provide a diagnosis, but rather an organ or anatomic region of interest that might be amenable to a biopsy. In this way, it's actually beneficial that these scans are very nonspecific because they'll pick up infections, malignancies, and non-infectious inflammatory problems 
all relatively well. In fact, some clinicians advocate for using PET scans much earlier in the algorithm under what I've labeled Tier 2. And if the nuclear medicine scan is non-diagnostic, then we're not really sure where to go next. If there is any hint of neural findings, even things previously dismissed as nonspecific or unlikely relevant, like headaches or so-called brain fog, one could consider a lumbar puncture and neuroimaging. Culture-negative endocarditis is much rarer now than it was in the past on account of better culturing techniques, but an echocardiogram could be considered. A blind biopsy of an organ as a shot in the dark is sometimes considered, though since this is invasive and low yield, it's uncommon. Finally, if everything up to now has been negative, one can consider watchful waiting with periodic reassessment. A few final notes. Empiric antibiotics and or steroids are sometimes used as a diagnostic trial. However, these will reduce the yield of future cultures and biopsies, potentially making the eventual confirmation of a specific diagnosis more difficult. Thus, empiric treatment is not recommended unless the patient is severely ill. Among those patients with idiopathic FUO, some will eventually develop new symptoms or findings that lead to a diagnosis. And some will experience spontaneous remission of the fever. Death from the underlying cause of an idiopathic FUO is very rare. In other words, the most serious causes of FUO, such as endocarditis or malignancy, are almost always uncovered by the conventional FUO workup I reviewed. The key takeaway points of this video. Variable definitions are used for fever of unknown origin, but all incorporate a duration of illness of about three weeks and a non-diagnostic initial battery of tests, including cultures, chest x-ray, and usually abdominal imaging. Worldwide, the most common etiologies for FUO are infections, while in the developed world specifically, a significant number of cases remain idiopathic. And last, testing for FUO should be organized into tiers and focused whenever a potential diagnostic clue is uncovered, such as an associated symptom, an unusual physical exam finding, or a test abnormality.